Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers of this workshop for putting it all together and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I apologize, there won't be a lot of complexity theory in the talk, it'll be mostly geometry, but hopefully the geometry will give you some insight to the complexity theory, if not today, in the f uh, someday in the future. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, oh, I'm also hoping this will be graduate student friendly, so uh, if you have questions, especially if you're not a graduate student, if there's something you don't understand, you should please ask. You'll be doing a graduate student a favor. So I'm going to work over the complex numbers. So A, B, and C will be complex vector spaces. So that'll be, say, C, A, C, B, and C. <laughs> And uh, a tensor we may think of this as a bilinear map. So we have some alpha beta maps to T of alpha beta. Or we may think of it as a trilinear map. alpha, beta, gamma. If we were originally handed our tensor as a bilinear map, we can convert it by just doing this. So for example, for matrix multiplication, so it's a little daunting that uh, the world's experts on upper bounds for matrix multiplication are, have spoken and are speaking in this workshop. So I'm not going to do much of history today because you're going to get plenty of that. And I hope I, the little I give, I hope I get correct. OK, matrix multiplication. Uh, so remember, um, our vector space A will be a space of linear maps. From some vector space U to a vector space V. Our vector space B will be linear maps from well, unfortunately, I'm going to have to dualize, but from V to W, and C from W to U. And uh, as a bilinear map, <coughs> this M, U, V, W, that'll be my notation for matrix multiplication, is um, composition of linear maps. So I take a linear map from W to U and a linear map from um, oh, W to V, sorry, the way I did it, and a linear map from V to U. And this goes to the composition, uh, which is a linear map from W to U. <coughs> or as a trilinear map. Um, I have some F, G, and H mapped to the trace of F, G, H, where I take the composition three ways. Any questions? <coughs> so this is kind of the star of our show, so we better make sure we understand matrix multiplication. Um, as a tensor, so there's a, a canonical linear map from a vector space to itself <coughs> called the identity map. It's invariant under changes of bases. And matrix multiplication is just the unique canonical element of our space. Where I rearrange the factors so that they're ordered correctly. And it's the unique up to scale. So, so did you intend to have a, a difference between the, the left board and the right board? The left board, you're going from U to B to or something? Yeah, or I, yeah, I don't care. OK, that's fine. Um, unique up to scale tensor invariant <coughs> under GLU cross GLV cross GLW sitting inside GL 
A cross GLD cross GLC, where GL of A is the invertible linear maps Now, if um, U, V, W are all the same dimension, then we also have a cyclic symmetry because the trace of X, Y, Z is equal to the trace of Z, X, Y, and a Z2 symmetry because the trace of x, y, z transpose is equal to trace of x, y, z. And this is trace z transpose, y transpose, x transpose. I won't write this low usually. So the measure of, well, a measure of complexity that we'll use is tensor rank. So let's let um, sigma r zero be the set of tensors but I can write it as a sum of R rank one tensors where if I have A tensor B tensor C and I want to think of this as a trilinear map Some alpha, beta, gamma. Oh, by the way, A star is the space of linear maps from A to my ground field. This goes to alpha of A, beta of B, gamma of C. Questions? Is this still graduate student friendly? Too much silence. So um, sigma r, uh, sigma r will just be the closure, and you can either take Euclidean, that is under limits, or Zariski, that is the common zero set of all polynomials vanishing on this set, and it's a theorem, elementary theorem in Mumford's book that you get the same answer. We'll say R of t is less than or equal to R if t is in sigma R0 and R bar, this is called the border rank, of t is less than or equal to R if t is in sigma R. Um, <clears throat> so the naive algorithm, so I, I yeah, this is going to be mostly expository. Uh, the naive algorithm says that the order rank of matrix multiplication is at most n cubed, and people kind of believed that was optimal. Uh, Strassen, of course, showed it was not. He showed that the rank of M2 is at most 7, uh, and that implies that the rank of M2 well, let me be a little bit more precise. 2 to the k, well, no, let's just say mn, uh, is at most um, order of n to the 2.81 or whatever. Uh, let me give a proof of that. <coughs> that the, I'm not going to give a proof of Strassen's algorithm, which is an algorithm, but just remind you why uh, it propagates because um, the matrix multiplication U V W tensor matrix multiplication U prime V prime W prime is equal to matrix multiplication U tensor U prime V tensor V prime W tensor W prime um, because identity on U tensor identity on U prime is identity on u tensor u prime. So this is first ingredient to the proof. So i.e. Um, m n tensor m n equals m n squared is a tensor. 
and um, two, that the rank of any tensor product of any two tensors in disjoint spaces is at most the product of the rank. So you put those two together and you get this asymptotic bound. So <laughs> there's been a lot of work, see other lectures, that leads to this astounding conjecture that I, I still, I can't even say it out loud, it strikes me as so bizarre, that as you go off to infinity and get larger and larger matrices, it becomes almost as easy to multiply two matrices as it is to add them. So, i.e., uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, the border rank of matrix multiplication grows like n to the two plus epsilon. If it was addition, it would be n squared. This is n to the two plus epsilon. I didn't tell you that there's a constant, right? So you can make the constant 10 bazillion if you have to. Right, so, um, so algebraic geometry has a clear role to play in trying to, say, disprove this conjecture. Namely, uh, as I said, this closure under taking limits is also the closure under zeros of polynomials. And algebraic geometry is all about studying zero sets of polynomials. So if you want to prove a lower bound on the complexity of matrix multiplication, you should look for a polynomial that vanishes on this set that does not vanish at this point. So that's the role of algebraic geometry. You look for a polynomial. Vanishing on this variety does not vanish at that point. This point is not in that variety. You conclude the border rank of matrix multiplication is greater than R. And there's a little bit of history with that. Classical. Why is it enough to care about border rank as opposed to the actual rank? Uh, you will hear this in the other lectures today. Um, basically, the, if you're taking border rank, you're taking a limit of curves of some order, say order 36. So that may multiply the rank by 36 times the border rank. But when you take the tensor tensored itself, uh, that 36 becomes less important. And the, um, the gap between rank and border rank will close as you take larger and larger tensor powers of a tensor. Okay, but you'll probably you'll see that later today in, in one of the lectures. There's a proof in many books. Yeah. Um, so it's classical that the um, order rank uh, matrix multiplication is at most n cubed because that's the standard algorithm. And then, as I said, Strassen. Oh no, I wanted to do border, uh, lower bounds. I'm getting a little dyslexic here. So classical, I need lower bounds. Uh, greater than or equal to n squared. Strassen, everything has Strassen's name on it. That's why I get confused. Uh, this is at least 3 halves n squared. And then with Ottaviani, oh, and then uh, plus an error term, I lick tie. And then uh, with Ottaviani, we got this up to 2n squared minus n. And that's where it stands at the moment. But today, I want to do something that is, <clears throat> was not at all clear to me would be even possible a year ago, namely to discuss a possible role of algebraic geometry for upper bounds and for deriving new algorithms. So today, algebraic geometry and upper bounds. Before I start the talk, any questions? Yeah. Just a quick question. So what happens over other uh, fields or other rings? I mean, do things 
is more known in that case? Less is known. Well, yeah. no, nothing's known. Nothing's known over any field, so it doesn't really matter which field we're talking about. Um, so let me draw a, a picture. So let's <coughs> talk about algorithms for rank. So in algebraic geometry, you don't just study a variety. You study varieties in families. And you want to study the largest family you can. So over your variety, well, or your set of tensors of rank R, we'll have a new set, which will be the algorithms. So this will be um, pairs. Say we have a point P, P and expression of P. And um, if we're so lucky that we have a tensor which has symmetry, sitting inside our group of all changes of bases in our ambient space, then this symmetry group will act on an algorithm. And it may move the algorithm around, or it may keep it still. And you would expect, say we have a positive dimensional symmetry group, that over this point we'll have a, a positive dimensional fiber of different possible algorithms. And we should not study one algorithm at a time. We should study all possible algorithms at once to get a geometric picture. So uh, last year, in fact, almost exactly a year ago, uh, four of us did a uh, derivation derivation and I want to emphasize proof of Strassen's algorithm from geometric considerations alone and I won't talk about that because I've talked about it several times but I want to point out that it's a nine-parameter family, as you would expect. And um, there's a three-parameter subfamily. So I have to write seven. So this is um, Strassen's algorithm for two by two matrix multiplication. I have to write seven as one plus three plus three. And in this three-parameter subfamily, um, this 1, this 3, and this 3 are Z3 invariant. And if I write 7 as 1 plus 6, we have Z2 invariants. This 1 is Z2 invariant, and then the sum of the 6 is Z2 invariant. Okay. So now it's known that Strassen's algorithm is optimal, both in the rank and border rank sense. And you would only expect to get reasonable geometry if you're studying optimal algorithms. Unfortunately, the number of optimal algorithms that we know is uh, very, very little. Uh, and we also expect, generally, that the border rank of matrix multiplication will be much lower than the rank of matrix multiplication. And a border rank algorithm just by its nature, is going to be much more subtle than a rank algorithm. For example, it will never be unique because it involves taking limits. There's a lot of different ways of taking limits. So nonetheless, uh, let me tell you the first successful border rank algorithm. So this is Dini, Capovani, Lottin, Romani. I didn't erase their names. Good. Uh, and let um, ACLR, let this be um, M2 minus, um, well, but with one entry of first matrix equal to 0. So explicitly, if you like, 
you can write it as x11, y11, z11, plus y12, z21, plus x12, y21, z11, plus y22, z22, 21, plus x21, y12, z21, oh, sorry, y11, z12, plus y12, z22. For example, so it's clear that the rank of this tensor is at most 6. In fact, you can prove that the rank of this tensor equals 6. And their theorem is that the border rank of this tensor is at most 5. And in fact, it equals 5. Um, and that can be used to prove that this exponent of matrix multiplication, which I have not defined, is at most 2.79. And uh, the proof was an explicit algorithm found by their computer. <coughs> okay, so there's a lot more math that goes into here than I'm mentioning. For example, uh, the notion of border rank was unknown to computer scientists until Beanie uh, rediscovered it. And then he had to prove that border rank was as good as rank uh, for um, the exponent of matrix multiplication. So the one thing I'd like to talk about today that will be new is a geometric perspective on this algorithm. And that's due mostly to a first year graduate student right here at UC Berkeley, Nick Ryder, who's in the audience. But be so um, today, a geometric uh, view of this algorithm, which I didn't write down, because if you write it down, it doesn't look like anything. But uh, let's go back before that. Um, let me talk about some generalities on. on um, border rank. So this is mostly classical. If anything's new, um, it's with Yarek uh, So let's see, what is what do we know? So the picture that I always have to draw is this. So if we think of this as um, sigma 1, then a point of sigma 2 you get usually by picking two points of sigma 1 and some point on the secant line. And then as we teach our calculus students, though, that the limit of secant lines over here, uh, this point is not on a secant line. It's on a tangent line. So we have um, points, say, x1 and x2 going to some point x0. We get um, some x prime in the tangent space to x0 of sigma 1 that will um, have border rank of x prime will be 2 and the rank of x prime will be greater than 2. It will not be on a secant line. So in particular example, <coughs> so I can take the limit as t goes to 0, 1 over t, if you've never seen this before, a1 plus ta2, b1 plus tb2, C1 plus TC2 minus A1 tensor B1 tensor C1. Of course, there's one pathological case where the rank actually equals 1. Right? I'll try to make it through this lecture. I think what I wrote on the board is correct. If it's not the whole truth, it is nothing but the truth. So um, if you take another derivative with just two points, this is a, you can think of this as one derivative with two points. If you take a second derivative with two points, you get nothing new. But if you take three points and crash them together, this 
say I take point here, point here, and another point, and I send them all to this point. Then uh, you can get things of the form um, x prime plus x double prime. So explicitly, you could get a point like a1, b1, c3, plus a1, b3, c1, plus a3, b1, c1. That's just like what we got over here, plus a1, b2. Oh, so this x is a1, b1, c1. Sorry. And I've been lazy about writing tensor signs. And um, if I have another set of points on my curve that also, if I have more points, I can get as many second derivatives as I want for free. Uh, more generally, uh, I'll have q plus 2 points crashing together. You get um, uh, get a sum of q such terms. Okay, now let's do a quiz for the ringers in the audience. Uh, what tensor do I get? It's the. I give you a hint. If you do upper bounds, it's your favorite tensor. This is the coppersmith Winograd tensor. So um, I point out that the border rank is q plus 2, and expect that the rank is about twice that. So from the point of view of algebraic geometry, from the point of view of upper bounds of matrix multiplication, this is so far the world champion, even if uh, it may not be the world champion for long. Or if it is, then the board. I have a question. Then the Don't exponent. you get different kinds of tensors as you crash them together in different ways? I mean, that should Well, if you make everything crash to one point, mm -hmm. uh, you can get sums of second derivatives. You can get other things. In, for a general algebraic variety, those other things are very interesting. But for a triple segre product, those other things are not as interesting. Right. So if you do, I'm just thinking about other schemes, you know, functional Hilbert schemes. Yes, yes, schemes yes, yes, yes. They yes. don't get you anything interesting. No, they do for other varieties, or even if you have more than a triple segre product. But a triple segre product, you can pretty much see everything at two derivatives if you have all your points coming together. But we're going to do something more interesting than having all our points coming together. So this, from algebraic geometry point of view, is boring or not so interesting. So um, more interesting is to have um, r limit points that are not linearly independent, that are linearly dependent, I guess I should say, that are linearly dependent. So this is kind of a historical lecture. I'm going backwards in time with as far as these tensors are concerned. But turns out the one I just erased is going to be the most interesting one for today. And the other one of historical significance is Schoenhage's tensor. <coughs> so Schoenhage's tensor <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, it's this. OK, it's not this. But you should think of this as this. This is um, just matrix vector, sorry, row, column, uh, matrix multiplication to get an m by m matrix. Um, but, and so this thing has um, the rank of this thing equals its border rank equals m times n. You can't do better. 
But what you can do that's better is you can add on a little afterthought. And I'll explain these numbers. And you could do a lot better. Basically, this comes almost for free, to be precise, at a cost of 1. So this sits inside Cn plus Cm minus 1, n minus 1, tensor Cm plus Cm minus 1, n minus 1, tensor Cmn plus C1. So this is my A, this is my B, this is my C. And note that this thing is really scrawny. So if we look at Cn tensor Cm tensor C1, which sits inside here, this is of dimension m times n. So any mn plus 1 points in here, also on sigma 1, must be linearly independent. Thank you. And this is Schoenhage's algorithm. Well, that tells you the starting point of Schoenhage's algorithm. There's basically nothing interesting going on. At the level of first derivatives, it gets a little interesting, but uh, not so exciting. So now I should get to some geometry. Oh, I just erased Nick's name. And I'm about to describe his work. So, yeah, so let's first um, describe this uh, tensor uh, without coordinates. So first of all, there's nothing special about setting x22 equal to 0. So not only should we be studying a family of algorithms for a tensor, we should be studying a family of tensors. Namely, um, let me write it down. So let's let u, v, w, b, c, 2, 2 by 2 matrix multiplication. And so this tensor is our usual 2 by 2 matrix multiplication. Minus m, well, how did I find my x2, 2, two I, to set equal to 0? Well, I had to pick a line in u star and a line in v. And that gives me a point on the segre. So let me think of it that way. I take LU, LV, and W. So this is, this, I should write this as M222, and this is M112. But these are not disjoint. This is killing that coefficient of x22, or whatever you want it to kill. So this is a. Um, P1 cross P1's worth of tensors. They come in a family. So this P1 sits inside P, uh, no, that's P0 cross P0. Uh, it's, no, it is a P1. This is P, PU, and this is PV. So we pick a point in PU, a point in PV, and we get a beanie type tensor. Okay. So it's parameterized, well, maybe u star to be precise. U is a P1. Hmm? Why is that? Yeah, u, v, and w are C2. And this is um, u star tensor v, <coughs> tensor v star, tensor w, tensor w star, tensor u, which is C4, tensor C4, tensor C4 is our ambient space. OK? So we have this, these lines, LU. Now, um, instead of having this gigantic linear space, let me talk about lines. Uh, so lines are the next most interesting thing. Rather than having linear spaces, we're going to find an interesting configuration of lines. 
So the most elementary object you learn about in high school geometry that's really beautiful is this hyperbola. And you learn that it has two families of lines on it. Let's call them alpha lines and beta lines. No two alpha lines intersect. Any alpha line intersects any beta line. So inside P of U star, so I'm going to change notation, uh, this segre. So this is what, um, these are the rank one two by two matrices. Inside here, I have these lines. And inside a triple segre, I have, say, alpha lines, beta lines, and gamma lines. So what does an alpha line in, in the hyperbola look like? It's something of the form A tensor uh, C2. So that will be an alpha line. And a beta line will be anything in the first space tensor that. Any questions? So um, on, this, on this variety of rank one tensors, recall that we have the internal structure here. So, so let's call this, so this is P of um, V star tensor W. So choose a new line, new for related to V, new line in P of V star tensor W. Uh, and that gives rise to a beta line in the big thing. After a choice of, um, so this new line will be of the form V tensor W. So I have to pick a V. My V is going to be picked in a strategic way with respect to that line, which it's basic. So the, this, this V is basically dictated by this line. Um, and this W is all of W. But now I have to choose a omega in W star. And the points here that get fixed, oh, this is not a beta line. Yes, it is. It's, oh, I switched nomenclature. Right. So here, an alpha line is where I fix a line in here and two points here. Sorry about that. So the beta line. I have a line in here, and I have a point here and a point here. The choice of this line and this line dictate what this point must be. And they dictate what this point must be up to a choice of w. And so I get an L beta. And then there's a symmetry in this algorithm. This space and this space are of the same dimension. Uh, and this one is the is the weak one, right? We have a C3 tensor C4 tensor C4 is where our tensor lives. And so this thing, if it's geometrical, I should do the same thing to get um, a gamma line. And these don't intersect. So I have these two skew lines. And then it turns out, elementary geometry, there exists a unique alpha line intersecting both of them. And all this lives in a P3 or if you like, a C4. So all I need to do 
is take five points on this configuration in projective space. They will be linearly dependent. I can scale them such that they add to zero. And that's what, they, that's what you get for Beanie's algorithm. Those are the initial configuration of points. So you, take, you, you need to take two points on this line, two points on this line, and then a point anywhere on that line. And then um, I need to tell you a fact about uniruled varieties. If I look at the tangent space to the hyperbola at this point, and the tangent space to the hyperbola at any other point on this line, if I take a third point on this line, the tangent space to the hyperbola at this third point will be in the span of these two. And this generalizes to higher dimensions. Anytime you have a uniruled variety, uh, a P1 uniruled variety, and the tangent space to any point on this line will be in this tangent, the span of the tangent space to any other two points. And so the geometry here is not these points, but the lines. That's the lesson. The points you take don't matter, but the configuration of lines matters. And we have this sort of two-parameter freedom of choices of families of lines. So this is giving us, for each choice of tensor, we get a two-parameter family of lines. And of course, we know border rank algorithms are never unique, but this tells you the geometry, the different geometrical choices that one can make. And then finally, um, this ten tensor turns out to be a sum of two tensors. You could decompose it after you choose these lines, and one tensor will be a tangent vector to, in the sum of two points here, and the other will be in this tangent vector here. And that's, their, uh, that's the algorithm. So you get this Beanie algorithm, which was found by computer, actually has a very nice configuration of lines associated to it that Nick has worked out. Now, in the last five minutes, I actually, this is not you know, purely supposed to be entertainment. Actually, a lot of you look like you're not entertained. <laughs> um, yeah. I was kind of short on complexity theory this morning, sorry. Um, I, let, me, let me say a few more serious things. So, so let's talk about, well, I, I want to say general questions, which I don't know any answers to, but these should be the guiding questions. Um, find tensors with the border rank of t much less than the rank of t, because as I've implicitly discussed here, uh, the all tensors that have given new upper bounds on the exponent of matrix multiplication, the one thing they all have in common is their rank is greater than their border rank. And we now know that it's almost game over for the Coppersmith vinaigrette tensor. To look for new candidates, the guiding principle should be border rank less than rank. OK. The second thing is um, find the missing, and I'll make this more precise. Well, I may or may not make it more precise. Missing equations for border rank in the range uh, where m is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to 2 or 2m minus 1 for tensors in cm, tensor cm, tensor cm. For matrix multiplication, m will be n squared. And um, so this question is a sub-question of this, because how do you prove the border rank of a tensor is low? Well, historically, that's been done by just finding an explicit algorithm. But that's not going to go on for a whole lot longer. I mean, there's a lot of clever people out there, but you just don't get that clever after a certain point, And you want a systematic way of proving something is easy to compute. That is, if you were thinking of this in terms of matrix multiplication, this rank is sort of the value. The border rank is the cost. This is a way of lowering your cost. 
And these are, I, 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 yeah. And then um, find interesting configurations of points on this variety of rank one tensors. Now, though I, I have to say, this may not be the right thing to do because the world record holder is not an interesting configuration of points. It's just a single point that everybody runs towards. But there's a lot of things to find. So for example, if we look at, this is for the algebraic geometers, if we look at the twisted cubic sitting inside the segue of P1 cross P1 cross P1, and this sits inside of P3, so any um, five points here will be linearly dependent. You may be able to get an interesting tensor out of the twisted cubic. Or you could take a segre Veronese variety. Those also live in a um, linear subspace. And I expect these should give rise to tensors with very beautiful border rank algorithms. OK, so that's a little vague. So now let me be a little precise. Um, so this is uh, Mateusz. Um, consider a tensor that looks like this, A1 with B1C1 plus plus BMCM plus J equals 2 to M AJ B alpha J C beta J plus B gamma J C delta J, where alpha J gamma j are less than m over 2, and uh, beta j, delta j are greater than m over 2, and all distinct. So to do this in a, a square space, you need m greater than or equal to 7. Uh, if you're willing to uh, let this be a little unbalanced, you can get away with c4 tensor c5 tensor c5. So the picture if I look at T of A star sitting inside B tensor C as a space of matrices, it looks like this. And all the action is going on here with the A2s, et cetera. I have zeros elsewhere. So um, what is the rank of T in the border rank of T? So let me. Uh, be precise, let's do the simplest case where T is in C4 tensor, C5 tensor, C5. So you just write down twos, threes, and fours in this lower box. The reason this tensor is interesting is because it satisfies all known equations, but um, its border rank is certainly greater than n. That's m. That's not hard to prove. So. This is kind of, if we want to go beyond, you'll hear later this week about cactus rank. If we want to go beyond the cactus variety, this is the, this is the starting point. This is the simplest tensor I know that we just don't know how to compute its rank, even in C4 tensor C5 tensor C5. We expect the border rank to be pretty small but, and the rank to be larger. So another, uh, sub, another project would be to um, generalize so again, I'm, I'm kind of talking to the algebraic geometers here, but I'm asking the algebraic geometers questions for the sake of the computer scientists' uh, equations. So Shmuel Friedland uh, has, in fact, the only geometrically derived equations that I'm aware of, other than Griezer's <coughs> equations, that are equations, honest equations for border rank and not for the cactus rank that you're going to hear about tomorrow. So if you could generalize those equations, that would be very exciting. And then this is related to um, uh, what you'll hear about in Chris Ewan's lecture. So if you have an algebra that has an associated, matri associated multiplication tensor, what is the border rank of the multiplication tensor for the uh, permutation group? So this is only interesting probably when um, d is greater than 5. Uh, when d equals 3, for example, this tensor is just a 2 by 2 matrix multiplication plus two copies of 1 by 1 matrix multiplication. And in general, of course, any multiplication tensor in a 
al in a semi-simple algebra is a direct sum of matrix multiplication tensors. But if we studied the border rank directly, we may be able to get something interesting because the permutation group has the property that it has large characters, so it has high value in that sense. It may have low border rank for all we know. Okay, I better stop. Thanks. Diagram um, with the matrix picture where you were putting certain entries mm -hmm. to be zero and certain entries to be other, other things. Uh, this reminded me of Virginia's um, uh, locking. Yes. Yesterday. Yes. yes, and it was inspired by it. So, 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 do you have so I should say we're talking with Virginia trying to. Uh -huh come up with tensors of high value and low cost. Mm -hmm. That's a project with Mateusz in Virginia, yeah. But is there an algebraic ge geometry analog to what those blocks mean, uh, blocking uh, Well, it, so this thing here, the, the algebraic geometry is failing us, right? I mean, we cannot understand. This thing is in, look, this is in C4 tensor, C5 tensor, C5. We have lots of equations for border rank 5 in that space, like a whole lot. It satisfies them all, but you can prove by another method, which hopefully will get converted to equations, that its border rank is larger than 5. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so, yes, I mean, I, okay, I couldn't say everything I wanted to say, but there's some secret algebraic geometry going on here that we're trying to understand. And this is the simplest case. But we don't understand it yet, so I can't. If I could give a proper answer to your question, I would have given a much more exciting talk. I, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the cactus rank. So yes. Can it be useful here? For the... Well, so the cactus rank is not useful for the study of complexity of matrix multiplication operator. Um, the bad news from Yarek is that basically all the equations we know, except for Friedland's equations and Griezer's equations, and equations that were found by purely representation theoretic methods alone, which we don't know. If we find it by representation theoretic methods alone, that is kind of decomposing and, and looking at modules and stuff, then that we don't know how to generalize. But Schwell's equations are very beautiful, they're very geometrical, and they might generalize, because cactus rank is bad for complexity theory. Yeah. So, so this is a question perhaps for Olga as well, well as for you. So the, the coefficients <coughs> in your uh, tensor decomposition show up as coefficients in the numerical algorithm, yes. and their size determines the uh, numerical stability, or helps to determine yes. the numerical stability. So if you have a family of decompositions that all have the same rank, the same yes. complexity, we should try to choose the ones with the smallest coefficients. Yes. And so that would that could you know figure in the complexity too if you do bit complexity. Yeah, so there's 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 sort of the complexity that algebraic geometry has an obvious role in, and then I'm just learning in fact I've been also talking with Gray quite a bit about this and he, he's explaining to me that these numbers do matter. To me it's just a family of constants, but I know to you guys it's it's, it's real money, yeah. <laughs> real bits. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is the geometric equation about the green tensor that you had on the, on the first blackboard? Yes. Uh, is your description enough to give us uh, the local structure of the point representing the tensor in the, in the second variety, which means for instance, can you describe that this is a singular point, or since the border rank is different from the rank, you need to expect some singularity. And is that possible using your description, or there is something that you still need? I have not checked whether it's a singular point or a smooth point of the secant variety yet. That will be put on next list of homework problems. <laughs> uh, but your feeling is that you can do that with this description. Oh, yeah. I mean, because this is not a description. This is conjecturally, you would expect this to be essentially all the, yeah, you know, every, all you know, the algorithms. All yeah. And since it has a pretty. If you have, if you have all possible tangent spaces to all these algorithms, yes. you can 
show how they, they mix up badly, then this is a similar point. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But the re of course, the real thing I'm hoping to do is to generalize this example now that we see it the geometry, because you know, I know we were working to generalize rank examples, but the the more you study upper bounds, you realize that border rank is much more important than rank for upper bounds. And so you want to develop a geometry of border rank algorithms, not just a geometry of rank algorithms. And this is the very first step. So and it's been done. Yeah. Maybe I can follow up with a question for you and Jim. So these border rank algorithms, from the point of view of moving coefficients to the limit. What can we say about numerical properties? Because the coefficients meant to do I don't know. Is there a way of organizing the limit in such a way that it retains good numerical properties? That is outside of my expertise. <laughs> but there are people in this room who it is not outside their expertise. Okay, well, let's thank Jam again.